Good morning. Will you join me in the call to worship? At the name of Jesus, every knee should bend and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Glory to God. Amen. Gracious God, we thank you for being ever present with us. We know that we are never alone. Your mercies have been faithful and rich. Pour out your spirit upon us that we might do the work of your will. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor, trusting in the promise of forgiveness. Almighty God, we have been wandering in the wilderness of sin. We have complained in the face of your mercy. We've been selfish and conceited in the face of your sacrifice. We have not done your will. Teach us humility. Teach us gratitude. Infuse your spirit into our beings so that we might be reconciled to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. People of God, our sins are forgiven. The Lord is loving and we are reconciled to God. Therefore, let us humble and surrender ourselves to the will of God for the glory of the Lord. Please, please pray with me. Holy Lord, open our ears to hear your word. Open our hearts to understand them. Strengthen our will to follow them. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. A reading from the Gospels, Matthew 21, verses 22 to 32. Listen for God's word speaking to you through these verses of scripture this morning. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it from human origin? And they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do, do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. 
The father went to the second and said the same, and he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Today is Yom Kippur in the Hebrew calendar a time when people are called upon to examine their lives, repent of their sin, and commit to the necessary changes in behavior to move into the new year with a right relationship with neighbor and with God. Let us consider our thoughts, words, and deeds as we seek to live into a new and right relationship with neighbor and with God. This morning's parable is different from many of Jesus' parables because it has no punchline. There's no unexpected twist at the end of the the story. Even the chief priest and the elders who are not inclined to listen to Jesus' words got the point right away. It's almost as though there was no point in even telling the story. Everybody already knew it. The irony was there was no irony unless the irony was that they got it, but it didn't make any difference in their lives. Let's look at this parable in its context. It begins with the question of authority. The elders wanted to know on what authority Jesus had just marched into Jerusalem, entered the temple, overturned the tables of the money changers, and then was now uh, coming back uh, uh, to begin teaching on the steps. In today's world, there's a lot of talk about authority. Political figures, when accused of misconduct or even criminal activities, often rather than denying or defending their misdeeds, claim that their accusers are only politically motivated. They're only trying to make them look bad. By what authority do you dare point out my misdeeds. Jesus then turned to the uh, uh, discussion of John the Baptist, and he asked the, uh, ch- the priest, where did John get his authority? Uh, did his baptism come from heaven, or was it of human origin? Now, John had been highly critical of the temple elite, challenging their authority, but John had also been very popular with the people. If they affirmed John's authority, they validated his criticism of them as a brood of vipers. If they denounced John, they risk losing the people. I think on this particular Sunday, the uh, similarity between John the Baptist and Ruth Bader Ginsburg is unmistakable. Justice Ginsburg stood for change for and with those whose voice was not being heard. Her life was a life of putting into practice the lofty principles and ideals declared in our foundational documents. Declared, but not ever really practiced. One nation with equal liberty and justice for all. All people created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Well, they're unalienable unless you happen to be a woman or an Indian or a slave, check Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution, and you find that not all were equal from the very beginning. From where did she get her authority? Some in positions of privilege and authority are lining up to proclaim her greatness with their lips, for she was very popular with the people while at the same time they are pledging to confirm a successor who does not share her values before she's even put to rest and before that successor has even been named. The next, Jesus made an abrupt transition to the parable of the man with two sons. 
on the surface, this parable is a very, a very clear illustration that deeds are more important than words. But even the chief priests and the privileged and powerful knew that. There's no irony. But what does this have to do with the high priest's question of authority? So Jesus then levels an accusation, another rather abrupt transition. Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. Well, this doesn't quite fit with the rest of it. it. It is too abrupt to change. If this condemnation of the priest and the elders is based on the assumption that they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk, that is, they say the right things, but they fail to do the will of God, are we to believe that the tax collectors and the prostitutes are doing a better job of doing the will of God? It seems that they neither talk the talk nor walk the walk. It appears that Jesus was claiming that John the Baptist had authority because he was authentic, honest, and lived what he proclaimed, a person of integrity. By that same measure, he seems to be accusing the priest and the privileged of forfeiting any authority because they were hypocrites. They proclaimed truth and faithfulness to God with their lips, but they denied the same in their actions. I've often wondered about the pairing of these two, tax collectors and prostitutes. We, we hear that so much. Well, actually we don't. This is the only place that that phrase appears in Scripture. What does appear far more often is tax collectors and sinners. Uh, yeah, that's in the Bible about a dozen times. Or if we were to translate into the language of our Constitution, it might say slaves and women. So what do tax collectors and prostitutes have in common? It might deepen our understanding of this passage to explore how these terms are used in Scripture. Tax collectors, or more accurately, they would be toll collectors or tariff collectors in the Galilee, worked for Herod Agrippa, who collected tolls both for himself and for Rome. As goods would pass by the toll booth, the tax collector would collect the, 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 the toll, and the money would be sent to Herod, and some of it then furthered on to Rome. Now, some tax collectors were dishonest and became rich by overcharging the tariffs, but for the most part, they were simply resented for being there. They were an ever-present reminder of what was wrong with the political system that oppressed the people. Matthew uh, associates the toll collectors with Gentiles, I, I think indicating that the Jewish toll collectors had in some ways betrayed their fellow Jews and become traitors or aliens. They were unclean. Uh, we don't want to dwell too long on the prostitutes. We acknowledge that prostitution was prevalent in uh, the ancient Middle East. But prostitution in Scripture is also frequently a metaphor for those who had fallen away from the true worship of Yahweh and the true keeping of the law of Moses. No Jewish child grew up aspiring to be a tax collector or a prostitute. The commonality among these social outcasts was that either through their birth status or poor decision-making or both, they had become marginalized in the society. They were not better people than the priest or the elders. They were not doing the will of God more than those leaders of the temple. But they knew that they were unclean. So these flocked to John the Baptist to hear his call to repentance. Now, it's not clear just how much they actually changed, but they acknowledged their need for such repentance and for change and forgiveness. The religious leaders, on the other hand, were pretty good people, better than all the rest, or at the very least, way above average. 
they did not respond to John's call to repentance because they didn't need to repent or change. They just needed perhaps to work a little harder at being a little better at what they had been doing all along. The Hebrew people are segregated in, in worship, and they fall into three basic classes. The first are the priests, the direct descendants of Aaron. And the second group are the Levites, those who had been given responsibility for the care and maintenance of the temple. And then there were all the rest of the people. The priests were born to good families, raised in the ways of God, taught the law, and given authority. They were from birth better than all the rest. The Levites were also born into as a special class, but not quite as special as the priests, but certainly better than the rest. Well, I was not born into a good family. We lived paycheck to paycheck. I didn't go to a particularly good school, and growing up there was never any talk of my going to college. I was born to work in the factory like my dad. He had a pretty good work reputation, and so his foreman would, as we, the, we talked about it in those days, would use his pull to get me hired. Now, working in the shops, as we called them, wasn't a bad life. It was a decent living, but most folks working there wished they were someplace else. But they couldn't move because they couldn't give up their benefits, their health care, and their retirement plan. While there was never any talk of my going to college, in my household there was al it was always assumed that I would go to church. I wasn't born a priest or a Levite, but I was born a Christian. And I was also taught some biases that went along with that. We didn't have a lot, but at least we were not like those people who didn't go to work every day or those people who didn't go to church every Sunday. We were the good people that those other people needed to become more like. We could do better but we didn't really need to change. We just needed to work a little harder at it. Some years ago, William Esom wrote a book, Dancing with Dinosaurs, Ministry in a Hostile and Hurting World. Esom wrote that the struggling churches were in a better position to adapt to the changing needs of the world than the larger churches. He reasoned that the smaller churches knew that they were in trouble and that they needed to change, while the larger churches thought they just had to try a little harder, do a little better at what they'd been doing all along. After all, they were successful, better than all the rest. It has often been said in slightly different phrases, phrases that the enemy of better is often good. When you're good, you don't feel like you need to change. Those who see themselves as good feel no need for substantial change. And this self-satisfied self-righteousness divides people into two groups. Those like us and the rest of those that should want to change to become like us. These divisions cause us to become judgmental, often resentful, sometimes superior, better than all the rest. The problem is that none of us are really that good. There's always a need to change. There's always a need to be working on our relationships. But change comes hard when we feel that we are in some way already better than all the rest. The tax collectors and the prostitutes knew that they needed to change, even if they were unable or unwilling to really make the change. They knew they needed to repent, and they knew that they needed God. The good people didn't even know what was lacking. 
they didn't feel any need to change. Change was unthinkable for them because they were already better than all the rest. And so there was little hope that from their side, those walls of division would ever come down. Two weeks ago, you heard a sermon that told us that sometimes we need to step out of the boat, do something new and different and daring, take a step of faith. Those who are convinced that their life, their faith, their church is good enough, better than all the rest, find such change impossible. They cannot step out of the boat even if the boat is being swamped. Those who know their weaknesses, their faults, and even their failures are more ready to enter the kingdom of God where all are bound together as one, not by their merits, but by their need for a God who knows them, forgives them, and endowed them with certain unalienable rights. The God of the good and the God of all the rest. The kingdom of God is above all else, the place where the walls of division come down and where there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, but one people, no better, no best, just a kingdom of all the rest of us. Amen.
Let us pray. Lord, in the midst of the deep chasms of division that divide your people, we seek your healing. As we speak and seek to do your will, we find ourselves at odds with those who speak and act differently. We wonder how you can be Lord of all. Save us from the mire of despair and the pit of hatred and free us to continue seeking your will and let your love shine in our broken world. Amen. Friends, God is faithful and generous to us, upholds us and raises us up. Let us show our thanksgiving by giving generously to support ministries that ease the burdens and give rest to those in need. May we find a challenge from these words from Romans 13. Owe no one anything except to love one another. By doing this, God's whole law is fulfilled. May the God who is always near bless and keep you on your journey. Glory and honor and praise be to the creator, the savior, and the sustainer, now and always. Amen.